Chapter 17 Miracles Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master, and honourable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valour, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies, and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on women, women's, women's. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy? And one went in and told his lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the that is of thus and thus. Thus and thus said the maid that it is that is of the land. Thus and thus said the maid that it is of the, that is of the land. Oh dear, this is hard. Thus and thus, thus and thus, thus and thus said the maid that is of the, that is of the. Oh boy. Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed, and took with him ten talents of silver, and six thousand pieces of gold, and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, read the letter and it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he rent his clothes and said am I God to kill and to make alive that this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy wherefore consider I pray you and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me and it was so when Elisha the man of God had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes that he sent to the king saying Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariots, and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth, and went away, and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me, and stand, and call on the name of the Lord his God, and strike his hand over the place, and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farfar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them, and be clean? So he turned away, and went away, so he turned so he turned and went away in a rage. Went away. Hello, this is Nathan. Thanks for joining me in the booth. I really hope you're enjoying the live streams and videos. To find out more about this narration project, to make a donation, go to nathanteacher.com. Thanks. He turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and speak unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather then, when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean? Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, 
and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. 2 Kings 5, 1-14 Hang on a second. Now we're all right. The story here is a familiar one, and it is readily understood. A few details deserve additional attention. Naaman was an old Hebrew name, Numbers 2640, and its feminine form is Naomi. Names readily cross borders at times. Naaman himself was a Syrian. Naaman was a pagan whom God had blessed. Quote, By him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. 2 Kings 5.1 God's providential government is no respecter of persons or boundaries, and his blessings too are extended to all. Syria, as a buffer state against Assyria, was blessed by God and used for his purposes. Naaman's leprosy was not sufficiently far gone to incapacitate him. Moreover, Syria lacked the quarantine laws which God had decreed through Moses. In Naaman's household, one young slave was a Hebrew girl, quite young, who had been taken in... quite young, who had been taken in a Syrian raid into Israel. She was apparently well treated and felt no small concern for Naaman's welfare. She spoke of the power of Elisha. She spoke of the power of Elisha. Power. Power. She was apparently well treated and felt no concern. Hang on. Naaman's welfare. Naaman's welfare. All right. That explains it. She spoke of the power of Elisha to heal, and she longed to see Naaman avail himself of that power. Her comment was reported to the Syrian king, who greatly valued and honoured Naaman. Accordingly, he ordered Naaman to go to Samaria and to seek healing, and he sent a letter to the king of Israel to ask for this. His assumption was that Elisha would be an honoured part of the court, not an outsider and a stranger. Naaman took with him gold and silver, having a value in terms of 1950 of $80,000 and worth much, much more now. The clothing too was very valuable. The reaction of the Israelite king was one of shock and horror. He saw the letter as a provocation. It asked for a miracle as an excuse to wage war. Such pretexts were not uncommon. As H.L. Ellison pointed out, quote, An example of such methods is when Epepi, the last Hiskos pharaoh, picked a quarrel with his Theban vassal by complaining that the roaring of the sacred hippopotami in Thebes was disturbing his sleep in Avaris, more than 300 miles to the north. Elisha, then in Samaria, immediately intervened. Ah, End quote. Elisha, then in Samaria, immediately intervened to offer his help. When Naaman arrived, Elisha did not meet with him. So that the emphasis on healing would be God-centred, Elisha simply sent a message out to Naaman. The requirement was simple. Naaman must dip himself into the Jordan seven times. Naaman, who expected a dramatic exorcism-like scene, was angry. His servants persuaded him that the important thing was to seek healing, not a dramatic formality. Naaman obeyed, and he was healed. The sevenfold bathing referred to the covenant of God with Israel. The number seven signifies fullness and was common as a covenantal symbol. Naaman's healing was to be a covenant work, and Naaman was to be brought into the covenant. Israel was facing judgment, captivity and destruction. Naaman's healing and conversion thus represented the forthcoming ingathering of all peoples into the covenant. We must turn again to the fact of miracles and their prevalence in the ministries of Elijah and Elisha. Miracles are not evenly distributed throughout biblical history. Generations and centuries pass at times without miracles, and then suddenly there are many of them. Thus, 
centuries after, after centuries. After centuries, miracles suddenly become dramatically prominent with Moses in Egypt. The ten plagues were so great in scale that no one in Egypt could be ignorant of them. The significant fact is that these miracles were not only a mighty witness to and against Egypt, but also death for Egypt. Israel's wilderness journey after its deliverance from Egypt was attended by many miracles, including manna, which was a witness six days in seven to God's miraculous power. The wilderness miracles witnessed against Israel to sentence a generation to die in the wilderness. The conquest of Palestine included major miracles as well, and the conquest was followed by defeat and judgment for generation, as Judges makes clear. The age of Elijah and Elisha was a remarkable era of miracles, and it preceded the destruction of Samaria and Israel, and marked the beginning of the Babylonian captivity. Judea then became witness to the greatest miracles, those performed by Jesus Christ, and the consequence was the destruction of Jerusalem and Judea. Miracles and judgment go together. When God manifests his power in miracles, two things, among others, become manifest. First, God's power enters history to alter something on the human scene, dramatically and clearly. This miraculous power is fruitless in that it does not change men's men's This miraculous power is fruitless in that it does not change men's headlong quest for judgment and destruction. Our Lord says at the conclusion of the parable of Abraham, Lazarus and the rich man in hell that if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be... Okay. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be... If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be neither will they be persuaded persuaded if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded neither will. Neither will they be persuaded the one rose from the dead. Luke 16.31 Shortly before his crucifixion, our Lord resurrected the real Lazarus, who had been dead four days. John 11.39 Here was a man who could speak concerning heaven and witness to Christ's power. The response of the leaders to this. The response of the leaders to this. The response of the leaders to this was to plan our Lord's death, John eleven forty four fifty three, and the people cried out for Christ's crucifixion. The people cried out. And the people cried out for Christ's crucifixion, John nineteen six. The greatest miracle, Christ's resurrection, also brought no healthy response. Miracles thus witness not only power, not, not only power, God, the power of God, not only the power of God, I guess. Miracles thus witness not only the power of God, God a power of God, but in but necessity for. I'm sorry, that makes no sense. Uh, I'm going to have to pause this. Miracles precede judgments and witness to the stubborn and determined rebellion of men. Hence, as David says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. Psalm 14.1 The fools of every age are doomed men. All right, I had to leave a bit out there because I could make neither head nor tail of it. I hope you're not too triggered by that.
So thanks for listening and uh, see you in the next one. Chapter 18. The Practical Faith And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him. And he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. Now therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. But he said, As the Lord liveth, before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. And Naaman said, Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servants two mules' burden of earth? For thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offerings nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. Uh, Try again. Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules' burden of earth? For thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. In this thing the Lord pardon thy servant, that when my master goeth into the house of Rimmon to worship there, and he leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, when I bow down myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. And he said unto him, Go in peace. So he departed from him. So he departed from him. So he departed from him a little way. Second Kings five fifteen to nineteen. Naaman, after his healing, returned in gratitude to thank Elisha and to present him with his gifts. As he meets with Elisha, two things stand out. First and foremost, Naaman is now a regenerate man. More than his body has been made whole. Joyfully he speaks of his new understanding. Nowhere in all the earth is there the worship of the true God but in Israel. Naaman's worship and service is henceforth to be to the true God and to him alone. Second, Naaman manifests, as we have seen, gratitude both to God and to man. He will henceforth worship God alone and offer burnt offerings and sacrifices to him and to none other. To him. And offer burnt offerings and sacrifices to him and to none other. Uh, none, none other. Hmm. And offer burnt offerings and sacrifices to him and to none other. None other. None other. And offer burnt offerings and sacrifices to him and to none other. He is also grateful to Elisha, and eager to bestow on him the costly gifts of gold, silver, and the raiment which he had bought. Brought. Bought. There is a difference, you know. Silver and raiment which he had bought. Brought. Brought. silver and raiment which he had brought we are reminded in this incident of our lords all right just a little bit slow here we are reminded in this incident of our lord's healing of ten lepers of these ten only one a samaritan returned to thank jesus and give glory to god luke 17 11 to 19 elisha refused the gifts He did not thereby imply that such gifts were always wrong. In this case, Elisha rejected the gift in order to keep the central. Elisha rejected the gift in order to keep central the faith. As a foreigner, Naaman was now in his first contact with the man of God. Elisha isolated Naaman in terms of his new faith. Naaman would be alone in Syria, a member of God's covenant, but with no covenant fellowship. Elisha's prophetic ministry required tithes and offerings. The prominent woman of Shunem provided 
you know, prominent women. The prominent woman of Shunem provided him with housing. The man from Baal Shalisha bought him first fruits, and so on. Second Kings four to nine, four and. Second Kings four nine to ten forty two. Naaman's case was different. There was no ongoing ministry to Naaman, and there was a need for Naaman to stand alone. If this gift had been received, Naaman would have sent further gifts, and this might well compromise his place in Syria. To send gifts to a foreigner under a hostile king could become a serious matter. The central point in this story has to do with Naaman's presence in the temple of Rimmon, the Thunderer, a pagan god. The king was apparently infirm. In going to the temple, he required the presence of a trustworthy man to lean on. In such a position, assassination was easy and not uncommon in antiquity. The attendant had to be, first, a totally trustworthy man. The king could have no doubts concerning him. For Naaman now to refuse would create a very serious would create for Naaman now to refuse. For Naaman now to refuse would create very serious problems. There was more than ritual at stake. The question was one of trust, essential trust. Second, such a person had to be strong and able, a competent defender of the king against attacks. Naaman's presence with the king was a part of his high role in Syrian affairs and inseparable from it. A man who could not be trusted next to the king could not be trusted to command Syria's army. Elisha's answer, approving of Naaman's request and position, is dealt with unfairly by many commentators. It is seen as evidence of the lower character of Old Testament morality. Such a position is blasphemous and offensive. First of all, Naaman was very sensitive to the problem, as much and more so than any man today. He feared that it might involve him in pagan worship, and he wanted no part of any other god. Second, in spite of his determination to worship God alone, Naaman did not even consider refusing to enter the kingdom of... Naaman did not even consider refusing to enter the temple of Rimmon with the Syrian king. His concern was God's understanding and grace. This is most important. Naaman was a man of responsibilities. It did not occur to him to abandon those responsibilities in the name of a pietistic holiness. His new faith only made him more sensitive to his duties. His intention was wholly godly, and he was assuring Elisha of that fact. When he bowed to Rimmon, it was only because he had to help the king bow to him. Elisha's answer was, Go in peace. The pietistic answer involves a misuse of Paul's words in 1 Thessalonians 5.22, Abstain from all appearance of evil. The word in Greek is eidos, the form or shape of something, that is, its reality, its actual appearance. In the English, we can read this sentence in two ways. First, the false but popular pietistic reading is, avoid everything that looks like evil to someone. This would require us to avoid doing anything which someone could misconstrue. Such an interpretation radically warps Paul's meaning. Second, appearance can mean the actual appearing or presents. Presents? That's a good... <laughs> Appearance can mean the actual appearing or presence of something. It then refers not to what someone might think, but to what actually is. Thus, we are required to abstain or avoid the realities of evil. We are not to involve ourselves with such realities. In the house of Rimmon, Naaman was not worshipping Rimmon. He was doing his duty to the king. To sacrifice an important work because someone might misinterpret what Naaman was doing was hardly godly. 
This pietistic perspective has, however, led to the irrelevance of many churchmen to the world around them. If we begin to move in terms of appearances as the false imaginations of others, we move from a reality into a world of shadows and irrelevance. Finally, both Naaman and Elisha are abused because Naaman asked to take two mules of earth from Elisha's place of reverence. Reverence. Finally, both Naaman and Elisha are abused because Naaman asked to take two mules loads of earth from Elisha's place of residence. Elisha granted Naaman permission to take the earth. This is called superstition by people who are in no position to condemn either Elisha or Naaman. Their comments are presumptuous. Quite regularly now, American tourists, devout fundamentalists, are baptised in the River Jordan. I was once asked by a couple to baptise their grandchild with water brought from the Jordan. Was this superstitious? Emphatically not so. It represents a desire for closeness to the place and land of our Lord's earthly life. Men sometimes keep their father's hat, for example, on their closet shelf long after his death to gain a sense of closeness. Modern man is too ready to call everything he does not do superstition and everything he does reason. At best, such an attitude is foolish. At heart, it represents an unwarranted pride. Such people, like Job's sorry comforters, assume that they are the people and that wisdom was born with them and will die with them. Job 12, 1 and 2. All right, people, I hope you find that awesome. Not everything is awesome, but perhaps that was. You never know. One never knows. So, hope to see you in the next one. Well, I hope to. I hope you're there in the next one. See ya. Well done for listening right to the end. If you would like to know more about this important Christian audiobook project, please go to nathanteacher.com. Thanks.